Regain your financial freedom by grabbing the book Ten Commandments of Black Economic Power, an Amazon bestseller written by none other than Dr. Boyce Watkins. Grab the book now. Also, Heating Up Summer 2023, Be One the Movie, starring Dr. Claude Anderson, Madam President, and Riza Islam. Atlanta, Georgia, get ready. The All-Black National Convention is coming your way October 2023. We had the privilege of attending an All-Black National Convention. It was an absolutely life-changing experience to get a free Dr. Boyce Watkins Black Business School training on how to make money without working. Text the word STOCK to 31996. Welcome to another episode of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother, Old Guy, from Hip Hop News Uncensored. And sitting across from me is my co-host. What's happening, y'all? It's your man, Sam, and CEO of Viral Hip Hop News. And you're in the building for a very special edition of yeah. the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. we got a special, special guest in the building on the podcast today. We got the Honorable Dr. Wesley Muhammad yes. on the podcast. How you doing today, sir? I, I'm excellent, but I have not earned honorable yet. I hope that if I hold fast to the robe of the one who is honorable, yeah. who has earned it, 60 years of consistent and uncompromising service to the cause of God and to the cause of black people, the honorable brother Minister Farrakhan, if I hold tight to his robe and try my best to follow his example, maybe one day I will qualify to, to wear that title honorable. Definitely appreciate you. Start there, the word honorable, because obviously it holds a title near and dear to a lot of brothers' hearts, in particular um, your own. So talk about that. What does it take for a man, a black man in today's society to be honorable? Yeah. You, you have to be endowed character and integrity with regard both to God and to our people, but not momentary character or momentary circumstantial integrity. You need to have sufficient a sufficient timeline of work that shows your consistent integrity and your consistent character. And so the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan has 60 years of such work. And see me, that's why I, we are quick, we in the old community, we are quick, for example, to give somebody the title Bob, right? Mm -hmm. We are quick to give somebody the title master teacher, and that's fine. I don't follow those trends because almost all of these persons whom we have bestowed the title Baba on, or we've described them as master teachers, they don't have a long enough track record to qualify for those titles because mm -hmm. We are taught that one can turn hypocrite in the blinking of an eye. So I am 30 years into this work, this labor. I need another, if I'm blessed by a lot, to have another 30 years of service. If that service shows itself to be one of integrity and character, then maybe, inshallah, I will qualify as honor. Definitely. Now let's go back to the beginning of your journey because um, you went to Morehouse and then at some point you were a Christian Then you went from a uh, Christian atheist. Mm -hmm. So take us there, you know, um, you know, finding out, cause I actually went through those, those stages as well, you know, kind of not believing, learning, being a Christian and finding out a few things. So take us back to that when you were a Christian and turned into an atheist to, you know, 5% of the NOI. Sure. So my early Christianity was no different than the average, the Christianity of the average so-called Negro in America, right? We're born into it. We were um, bestowed Christianity by our slave masters. And so the average black person is born in a Christian household. That was my story. And I didn't have a problem with it. I just had questions. These questions um, could not be answered by those to whom I posed them. Um, I was sent 
to a scholar of the community and on that fateful day, but not fateful in a bad sense, even though initially it was very painful, on that fateful day, having this discussion with this scholar, he shared with me for the first time the reality of how religion has been is largely man-made and has been manipulated by man to enslave and deceive humanity. Mm. He shared with me, which I did not know, of how the Pope had blessed the slave ships that left the harbor. He shared with me, which I did not know, the distinction between the teachings of that man Jesus the 2000 years ago versus the organized religion that we have come to do as Christianity. All of these things, quite frankly, devastated me. I didn't walk into his classroom on a expecting a conversation. I just had no questions that, you know, the answers I thought, well, I didn't for a second think the answers to them would threaten my continued existence as a Christian. And so I became so angry at the thought that I had been lied to by religious, religious persons. I became immediately bitter and I threw the baby out with the bathwater, meaning in throwing out religion, I threw out God. And I was in that state, a very bitter, and then I grew to be a very arrogant atheist for a good two years. And then while in Atlanta, Georgia, as a freshman student at Morehouse College, I encountered some Muslims. And I was shared some wisdom of the honorable brother minister Farcom that shook the foundation of my atheism the way those previous revelations shook the foundation of my faith in religion and God. And those words from the honorable minister Lewis Farcom were, he said, you know, you can put two black babies on an island by themselves and leave them alone. They will grow up believing in God because they will examine, observe God's creation, observe the universe and know instinctively that there is a creator. Now the reason that, one of the reasons that was so impactful on me is because at the very same time, I had a freshman physics class. And it just so happened that the subject on this day, this week, in physics was how everything in the universe, even seemingly random cosmic events, such as asteroids, seemingly chaos, but they submit and follow mathematical laws, so in the seeming chaos, there is order. And where there is order, there is an orderer. So that began a process of me swimming 9,000 miles back to my own, back to God. Powerful. Now, today's distribution of information is vastly different than information distributed, let's say, in the early 90s. Um, with that being said, the information we receive is so much more abundant. Do you still believe that Christianity has a stronghold over black people the way it did, let's say, in the early 90s um, today, given the information we have? No religion has a hold on black people as it once did. No religion. We are increased, we meaning Americans in general, certainly and especially black people who historically have been more religious than white people, white Americans. But the with every generation, we are becoming more cynical. And so no religion, Islam does not have the effect on black people the way it did 
in the 90s. So, and there are reasons and some good reasons for that. The cynicism of the American public, the cynicism of black people with regard to religion is well justified. Religion has been abusive and religious. Persons have been very unpersuasive in selling their wares. Awesome. I'm going to um, transition a little bit and talk about the um, the weaponization of hip hop music. You talk about that um, extensively, but two things in particular you talk about, you know, um, kind of like the beginning of hip hop where it was, you know, kind of uplifting message. And at one point it switched and you mentioned, you know, um, Snoop Dogg, Cypress Hill and uh, Seagram's Gin, you know, and then, you know, uh, at a point where, you know, um, there was a study on hip hop that drugs, alcohol, and violence references went up, you know, from 13 to 60%. Take us back to that um, and talk about the weaponization of hip hop in that first time when uh, Snoop Dogg mentioned Seagram's Gen and the agenda behind that. Okay, yes, sir. And and I think that's a great discussion. I think it should be framed okay. by another discussion. So I, I'm going to put something out there and then go after it in answering your question. Um, I believe that hip hop was weaponized in order to counter the influence of Islam on black America. Mm. And so in early hip hop, it wasn't just very conscious and very pro-social. It was very Islamic. And no one um, illustrates the nexus between you know, what they call rap nationalism in the golden era, rap nationalism in Islam on the one hand, and hip hop, right? The nexus is illustrated best by public enemy, right? Public enemy. Um, as impactful as they were in art on the his, in the history of hip hop this is 80s this is pre nwa you go from run dmc and the braggadociousness right the typical the, the mc and, and then public enemy bursts on the scene with a radical political message but it's a political message anchored so strongly, not just lyrically, but visually with the S1Ws, which were FOI. Mm -hmm. so the whole culture of Islam is being represented in this tremendously successful radical rap group. You know, who was surrounded on all sides by Jewish persons. So with the coming of public enemy and the rise of Islamic hip hop, the marriage of the, the whole landscape of hip hop in the early 90s, but really beginning in the late 80s with public enemy, that marriage of hip hop and Islam, Islam inspired by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, because remember, let me say this, the origin of public enemies, Islamic message, is Professor Griff showing up in the studio with the album of the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan's 1980 message, to Jack the Rapper. Mm. When Griff showed up in the studio on that day and played for Chuck D, the minister's Jack the Rapper message in Atlanta, that began public enemy as we know it. And that was a turning point. That was a pivot point for the history of hip hop. So hip hop and Islam are 
are wedded together. Farrakhan has such a huge shadow over hip hop now. You have Paris, you have all of these um, articulations, different articulations of Islam and hip hop. And then what happens? There's a controversy, right? Jerry Heller and Brian Turner out in Los Angeles. They here, they oversee the process from guys to niggas. You know, NWA, in the early NWA, was quite different from what NWA will morph into. NWA, as hard as its early lyrics were, NWA was born from the rubble of the crack holocaust in LA. That was ground zero for the crack holocaust in LA. The US government orchestrated crack holocaust in LA. So even the most social conscious hip hop coming out of late 80s LA was going to be very hard, very rugged, because it was born from the crack holocaust. But it was a very profound observation of what happened. Jerry Heller and Brian Turner, two Jews, when they put their money behind Easy e and Dr. Dre. And so Dr. Dre didn't smoke weed, right? He famously <laughs> said, rapped about not smoking weed, but what happened? 92 happens. The riots. The riots in LA happen. And Doug Morris, while LA is burning, Doug Morris, the Jew, Doug Morris, flies to LA, meets with um, Suge Knight. They are beginning to put death row record. He commits money. Him and Jimmy Iovine commits money for death row records. And the first production, while LA is still smoldering, Chronic is dropped. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden now, Dr. Dre is a big weed head. Well, just a couple of years prior, he Dismiss smoking weed. He didn't do it. And so now we have and we have the rise of this um weed soaked music. Cypress Hill, when Cypress Hill dropped their record, they were the first ones to really celebrate weed smoking, but that only affected the suburban whites. Okay, it was chronic that got black folks really smoking weed at that level because the studies show that by, before the chronic drop, young black people had the smoking of weed has receded tremendously among young people across the nation, especially black people. It had from the 60s and 70s by the late 80s and early 90s, it had bottomed out. But when the chronic dropped, and when, when you look at the chronic, you gotta look past Dr. Dre and even Suge Knight. You gotta look at Doug Morris, Jimmy Iovine, and Nega Brothman, right? And with NWA, when they went from, um, reporting the ravages of the crack epicenter to then they became a parody of self-hate, right? <clears throat> NWA became a parody of self-hate. They weren't authentic. Early they became authentic and Ren and Dre tells us how inauthentic that early NWA performance was with Jerry Heller and Ryan Turner, 
directing them. And so we have the, the shift from gods to niggas. There was a lot of God talk, black God talk in early hip hop. And then it became when the shadow, Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam shadow over hip hop became evident. Then you see these Jews really going in full gear in terms of changing the trajectory of hip hop. In your opinion, does, is there any correlation between what happened in hip hop and the main execs of hip hop to the West Coast as opposed to the East Coast when you have like your, your public enemies and, and groups like that um, preaching about gods? Is there any correlation to that or was that just coincidental in your opinion? What, the, the bi-coastal phenomenon? Yeah. The, the, well, fact that, the fact that it was more so, okay, NWA West Coast, public enemy, and, um, not Cypress Hill West Coast, the, the chronic West Coast. Like, Does that have any correlation or is that coincidental? Well, it probably does. Of course, California has always been the land of the leaf, if you will. Yeah. So in terms of the specifically the pot plot element of the weaponization of hip hop, and yes, the California context, I'm sure, is relevant. Though I would say this, the pot plot is only one aspect of the weaponization of hip hop. For example, while Doug Morris and Jimmy Iovine were around Suge Knight and the Death Row personnel and producing that so-called gangster rap, Leo Cohen was in New York. Mm -hmm. And Leo Cohen, another Jew, you know, Little Lansky, they like to call him. He's a Israeli an Israeli general in hip hop. Mm. He was at the same time in New York. Let me back up. Mm -hmm. The same Doug Morris that put money behind Suge Knight and Death Row Records. The first act he signed was Luke Skywalker. Right? And he gave Luke Skywalker and Luke, remember, Hey, we want some no yeah. porn rap, the birth of porn rap. <clears throat> that was Doug Morris, who said he didn't like hip hop. He's financing um get so-called gangster rap in LA. He's also financing booty rap in Miami. Hey, but he doesn't like hip hop. He was turned off by hip hop. But he signed the acts and put the money behind it. So Doug Morris put the, the money behind Luke Skywalker and porn rap is boom. Leo Cohen in New York says, I want to do you one better, Doug Morris. So he tried to create a female version of Luke Skywalker. Bitches with problems. Remember them? Mm -hmm. Bitches with problems mm. are, are was supposed to be the female answer to the raunchy rap of Luke Skywalker. Now, while bitches with problems, they dressed very New Yorkers. There wasn't anything um, sexualized about their dress. That would come from Craig Cowman and Little Kemp. But bitches with problems wrapped raunchiness and Leo Cohen had the nerve to say that bitches with problems are a better representation of urban black girls than is Queen Latifah. He said there's more bitches with problems mm. in the hood than there are queens like Queen Latifah. And so his Jew, Don Einer, the head of the company, he, he thought the whole idea of bitches with problems was so funny and he put the money behind it yet promote it, but he wouldn't let Columbia's label be associated with it. He didn't want his children to know that 
they have any relation to this pornography rap that is on the come up. And then of course to so so the pot plot is only one drug soaking music and drug soaking the culture. It's only one aspect of the weaponization of hip hop. Another aspect is the set the hypersexualization uh-huh. of black women and the homosexualization of black men. Both of those are aspects of the deliberate weaponization of hip hop. All right, so I definitely want to cover those topics, but I want to go back to the, to the marijuana thing because I heard you talking and you talked about, you know, that the loud and you said Molly, you know, at one point where government tested before they went out, you know, into the people and you cited that the higher THC levels is, you know, better for us as in raising the estrogen levels. Can you get into that and compare the THC and the CBD? aspect as well yes sir so just let me clarify the language okay loud and molly are not just government tested loud and molly are government groups <clears throat> i'll be clear when we are talking about loud we're not talking about this cannabis god's holy herb no sir um and by molly we're not talking about the MDMA that Merck Pharmaceuticals discovered in around 1912. In fact, Loud and Molly have the same author, Alexander Suj, a Jewish organic chemist who produced so many of the street drugs today. He is the key figure in producing this loud version of marijuana. And it is his formula of MDMA. His specific formula is what we now know as modeling. Alexander Shujin, government scientist, he produced loud because he did two things, which distinguishes loud from cannabis. God produced cannabis for the benefit of man. Satan produced loud as part of what the U.S. Army Chemical Corps officer, Colonel James Ketchum, what he described as his conquer by cannabis operation. Mm. U.S. Army Chemical Corps, their work with marijuana and its chemicals was part of what they described as their conquer by cannabis operation. Loud was produced to conquer a population, us. What makes loud distinct is two things. It's loud because it has an, especially in comparison to um, the marijuana of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Loud has an excessively high level of THC and an excessively low level of CBD because CBD is a natural check on THC. When God created cannabis, he created it. The reason cannabis can be described as a holy herb, the reason cannabis does have medicinal value is because God formulated the proportion so perfectly. The portions of THC and CBD, for example, they synergize with each other in a way that CBD stays or stifles the negative effects of THC and enhances the positive effects of THC. 
But if you separate THC from the right proportion of CBD, that's like separating in the language of our lessons in the nation of Islam. That's like separating the brown germ from the black germ. And we are taught that it's that process of separating the brown germ in the brown gene, separating it from the black gene that produced the Caucasian white man, the devil. The same applies here. Loud is a grafting out of CBD and a grafting up of THC. And so it has a more potent psychoactive impact. The other thing Alexander Shulgin did on behalf of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps and James Kennedy, the other thing he did was insert a nitrogen atom inside the THC molecule. Why is that important? Oh. THC had always been unique among the psychoactive plants, plants that can cause a psychoactive reaction. Cannabis was always unique because THC was non-alkaloid. It didn't have a nitrogen atom. Heroin, for example, morphine or opium, a psychoact a plant that produces a psychoactive chemical. It's an alkaloid because its psychoactive property has nitrogen atoms in it. Now, of course, heroin is very addictive. Cannabis originally wasn't addictive. A chief reason for the difference is the non-alkaloid nature of cannabis. The initially cannabis wasn't addictive because it did not have the chemical makeup necessary for addiction. It didn't have that nitrogen atom in it. It didn't have that alkaloid profile. Alexander Shulgin, on behalf of the U.S. government, fixed it. He inserted a nitrogen atom inside the THC molecule. Now, all <clears throat> marijuana products, all THC products that are made available. None of it is natural cannabis and natural THC. All of it is synthetic, the THC that's made available and all legal um, dispensary, all of it, the THC is a synthetic THC molecule, initially called Adam's nine carbon molecule. This is a synthetic, a fabricated, uh, lab created copy mm. of natural THC with the nitrogen atom in it. And this is why, and I'm closing this, this is why. Honey, Loud is addictive. <clears throat> when you when, when, when you say you, you smoke every day, you got to smoke every day. I know the false narrative, while we have to smoke every day, we're busy saying weed ain't addictive. Well, weed wasn't addictive. But loud is profoundly addictive because it's a different chemical. And it was Alexander Shulgin who produced Lao is Alexander Shulgin that produced the Molly. This name dropped in so much of hip hop today. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I want to transition and jump back to our previous conversation as well. When we were talking about the weaponization of hip hop, and you you closed on the hypersexualization of women and homosexuality when it comes to black men in hip hop. Um, in particular, let's talk about Lil Nas X. He was going through something with the Nike shoe. 
the, the blood shoe. I think he was in trial or going to court today, if I'm not mistaken. And then we've seen his BAT performance a couple weeks ago now. Initially, when Lil Nas X came out, he came out with Old Town Road, the country song, and they were giving him a lot of slack in the country um, department when it came to the genre of putting him in that genre. We defended him. We were on his side. Song was dope. We loved the message for the kids. Everything was cool. Then he comes out as homosexual. And although it's none of our business what he is, in our opinion, do what you want to do. It's kind of like, damn, here we go again, another black man. And now it's on another level. Now, here at the platform, you could do whatever you want. You know what I mean? You're, you're provocative. You're provocative to sleep with whoever you want. But we do see a looks like a trend when it comes to black men in particular in hip hop and what they're trying to promote to the youth. So can you break that down for us, in your opinion, what we're seeing from um, black men in hip hop when it comes to homosexuality? And if you want to discuss Lil Nas X in particular, please do. Yeah, I believe Lil Nas, Nas X is an excellent illustration of the process, mm. even the intricacies of the process of the homosexualization through hip hop. This quote from Little Nas X to me says it all, puts everything in its proper content. Little Nas X said, quote, he said this in July 2019, the month after, remember, Little Nas X came out on the last day of Pride Month, which is June. Mm. He came out shock the world but look at what he said he gives us context a word to the wise of what just happened a month ago he said this he said quote last year i was sleeping on my sister's floor had no money struggling to get plays on my music remember old town road was a mega hit at the time it was already a mega hit but he wasn't getting no money he had all of this talk and fame, but he was, he was still sleeping on my sister's floor, had no money, struggling to get plays on my music, suffering from daily headaches. Now I'm gay. So what happened? Mm. He's struggling, he's poor, but everybody, and singing his song, and then Ron Perry, one of Doug Morris's proteges, mm. they propositioned him. Since Lil Nas X came out as gay all of a sudden on the last day of Pride Month in 2019, Lil Nas X has blown up. His career has skyrocketed. And you can tell when I watched Little Nas X, his performance, I'm not and in any way an, an expert on the ways of gay people. Mm -hmm. But I'm watching him and it was very unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Meaning he didn't sell it good at all. <laughs> I could tell that he was acting. Yeah. He's trying to find his groove in this gay thing. And it doesn't come natural for him because I do not believe he is naturally gay. But Lil Nas X is on Sony. As is Tyler the Creator and Jadena. Both of them, both Tyler the Creator. I don't know if you heard his that outrageously gay freestyle he did in New York. Oh yeah, reflex. Reflex. Yeah. And then Jadena came out trying to convince us that homosexuality is naturally African. All of them are under Ron Perry, who's under Rob oh. Sony, who's under Rob Stringer. A Doug Morris lieutenant. Damn. The other side of that, the hyper sexualization. You know, we can't talk about Lil Nas X. Lil Nas X is 
represents the the black queer of hip hop. <clears throat> Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, those are the black Jezebels of hip hop. Now I'm not calling them right. Excuse me, Jezebels. When I describe their music as bad getting slut rap, I'm not calling any of my sisters slut. I wouldn't do that. I don't know them as individuals. I'm characterizing the genre of rap that they are representing. And just as we can characterize so much of 90s so-called gangster rap as what I call nigga killing nigga rap, right? That, that's the thing. I'm a nigga and I love killing niggas. I'm going to kill this nigga. Nigga is a self-reference. I won't call them that, but nigga is a self-reference and I'm going to kill this nigga. So nigga killing nigga genre of rap. Bad getting slut rap. They self-identify as slut. They self-identify as bitch. And their theme is, I'm going to get this bag. I'm going to use sex with whoever and how many ever to get this bag. So that characterizes the music they put out. So I don't know who the individuals are themselves. Remember, Little Kim was not like her stay for some. Yeah. Not in real life. The same one who made Little Kim made Cardi B. <clears throat> out of Barris the Record. The Jew, Leo Cohen's protege. So the you can trace the genealogy of the Jezebel hip hop or bad getting slut rap. Megan the Stallion, my dear sister, she was the first lady of 300 records. Yes, sir. Leo Cohen's record. And yes. Leo Cohen is the one that made young thug Jeffrey. Remember, Jeffrey is Young Thug with that dress on. Yeah. And Young Thug was adamant. He said, I'm not gay. Why is Young Thug or was Young Thug in all of these dresses? Leo Cohen and, and the Young Thug with the dress on. Leo Cohen Christian him Jeffrey. Why? Because Jeffrey is the name of a play written by a Jewish playwright that centered on this gay man named Jeffrey. And so when Leo Cohen created the Jeffrey um, alter ego, the young thug, and put him in these gowns, though young thug is not gay according to his own adamant admission, so it's Leo Cohen that is producing this drag rap with Young Thug. It's Leo Cohen who gave us initially Megan Thee Stallion. She's the first uh, lady of 300. And of course, it's Leo Cohen who gave us Bitches with Problems. Leo Cohen's protégés, Craig Cowman and Julie Greenwald, gave us Cardi B. So it's the same people who are the architect of all of the most damaging trends in hip hop and rap music and hip hop culture in general. Now, in your opinion, is it, you know, the fact that you know, these artists become popular. So when Cardi B becomes popular, she births a Meg Thee Stallion, you know, and, you know, as well as like on, on the men's side, is it more so, you know, of the labels doing it and, you know, a willing participant being like a Cardi B, do they know what they're doing? Is what I'm trying to say in it, or are they just kind of going with the flow 
because they're artists? Or do you think they're willing participants in trying to, you know, stray our children the wrong way? Now, of course, oh, I went off of two answers to that. Okay. The first answer, of course, now Cardi B. <laughs> she was about that life. Yeah. From, all, from <laughs> her braggings on her life, she was about that life. She was ratchet like that. She she got it in like that. Let her tell it on her lives. Right, drugging men and setting them up to be raped by transgenders, all of that. Okay, fine. However, musically, Craig Kalman admits to being the A and R that shaped Craig Kalman and Julie Greenwald, two Jews, proteges of Little Lansky, Leo Cohen, Israeli general. They admit to being the creative A R. Um, hand behind Cardi B. And so while I don't think I have no reason to assume Cardi B a person, I don't know her, her real life name, I the space now, but I, I have no reason to believe necessarily she would have been offended by what was offered or the direction her music was being shaped. We do know her music was being shaped. Now let me offer another answer to that with another example. To me, the, the greatest example is Too Short. Okay. We know Too Short from Freaky Tale, Too Short the Pervert. Mm -hmm. but that's not how Too Short started. Too Short didn't start as a pervert, he started as a Mac. Too Short was a player, Too Short was a Mac, but Too Short also was very conscious in this hip hop. And Too Short, he got with Jive Records and Bernie Weiss, another Jew. And Too Short described for us the conspiracy, his own words, the conspiracy that took place in the 90s did not just transform Too Short the Mac into Too Short the Pervert, but he says transform hip hop and made hip hop booty music soap because Bernie Weiss instructed him. Too Short the Mac wanted to make, because he always made Mac music, but he always made socially conscious music and Too Short wanted to make a full album like In the Ghetto a full album of social socially conscious music Bernie Weiss said no unless you make they made a verbal deal and Bernie Weiss said if you make the most raunchiest record totally off the meter in terms of freakishness, if you do that, I will let you make the positive album. Too Short said he made you nasty, right? With the nasty cover, porn saw on the cover, the birth of Too Short the Pervert, Freaky Mr. Freaky Tales. He did it because Bernie Weiss instructed him to do it in order to be able to make the conscious positive album he wanted to make and then after he made you nasty bernie weiss and jive records disallowed too short from making the positive album so too short said there was a conspiracy in hip-hop the label heads made a conscious decision to take hip-hop in the in the direction it made it pornographic in its expression and the same forces, see, Bernie Weiss in this relationship to Clive Davis and Clive Calvin. Um, R. Kelly, R. Kelly isn't the true freak of the industry. <clears throat> Bernie Weiss, Clive Cadler, Clive Davis, <clears throat> those are the real freaks of the industry. So yes, 
there is a de there was a deliberate orchestrated effort among the label heads and operatives to take hip hop in the these directions. But you did find you find people who wanted to to get that back. So Lil Nas X again go back. He said, "You shoot, I was sleeping on my sister's floor. They had no money. So now I'm gay. Meaning, no, I was proposition. <laughs> and I wanted that back, and I got that back. One more example. Yes, sir. One more time, not close. I think it's very short. Talking about Bernie. Uh, talking about Weiss. Mm -hmm. Um." Frank Ocean. Yeah. He's not a rapper, but they put him in a category of gay rappers. What I found extremely interesting is the origin, the career origin of Frank Ocean. He said that, well, Bernie Weiss is talking. The same Bernie Weiss. <laughs> wow. He said that. He signed Frank Ocean and he applies that he gave him a million dollar check and he had never heard any of Frank Ocean's music. What <laughs> then was it, Frank uh, Bernie White? Right. What was it that attracted you to <laughs> Frank Ocean? Why did you sign, why did you give him a million dollar check? And you didn't hear his music, so it wasn't based on his music. And of course, Frank Ocean's debut was the his song "Singing to a Man," if I'm not mistaken. So, the so now I don't know if if Frank Ocean was gay before that million dollar check. <laughs> but I don't know, but Weiss didn't hear no music. He had designs for he saw designs for. Frank Ocean, he cut him a million dollar check, sight unseen, and then we get this gay R and B slash hip hop on urban radio. All of a sudden, it's not an accident. Good point. I was going to ask you about Frank Ocean. Thank you for bringing him up because he, he was one of those ones that you don't even really hear too much. He he disappeared. Right, right. I think he served his purpose. He got his bag. And you, you know, I, I don't think it at that time it didn't catch, but they have been, um, they've been a drum beat, right? So I think Frank Ocean was their initial salvo, the initial effort. Um, and it he disappeared, but I think the Lil Nas X project, that's what it is, <clears throat> the Lil Nas X project signals the pinnacle of their success which is why he could put on that performance on a prime time television show the BET awards initially it was a family show we go from all of this hoopla all of this national outrage because Janet Jackson has a wardrobe malfunction that shows a little nipple. We go from that to an outrageously gay, menage a trois, double threesome gay performance, and the nation celebrates. <clears throat> so I think that we are witnessing the journey from the Frank Ocean initial pilot project that was a pilot it didn't catch on then they tried with um tyler the creator right he he, he flipped flopping going from he was so supposedly so homophobic when he first came out and then he's spitting these crazy gay bars <laughs> to flex and posing with alleged white lovers, whatever. But, you know, that didn't take, but the progression. Then Jadena trying to convince us that 
homosexuality is naturally African. And then we have um, Old Town Road coming out on the last day of gay pride all of a sudden. He's gay. I think we witnessed the initial attempt to it, the apex of its success with Lil Nas X. Powerful, powerful. Let, let's transition, man. You had some interesting comments to uh, speak on Bill Cosby. What is your thoughts on, you know, his situation and um, moving forward with Bill Cosby? Well, my first thought is the culture of Hollywood <clears throat> always been degenerate. So everybody in Hollywood, black, white, and everything in, in between. They participate in the degeneracy of the culture of Hollywood. The mildest of the degeneracy is of Hollywood is the sex and drugs, drugs and sex culture. I say mildest because the real signature of Hollywood is a very dark, <clears throat> organized pedophilia. Hollywood is a profoundly dark place. The greatest victims of Hollywood culture aren't women on casting couches. They're not women propositioned with drugs to have sex. The prey of Hollywood are young boys and the predators of Hollywood are the biggest names of Hollywood. Hollywood is a profoundly dark place. So when I say the mildest of the degeneracy of Hollywood is sex and drugs, I'm not minimizing, I'm not trivializing the experience of women who were subjected to the casting couch. I'm not trivializing that. Though I do know, as we all know, because of this thirst for fame, that a lot of females rush to the casting couch hoping to get cast. So there's victimization and there's self-victimization, but the children who are so tragically abused in and by Hollywood, that's another order of magnitude of its darkness. So I say all that to say Hollywood is degenerate. Hollywood is dark. Did Bill Cosby participate in Hollywood culture, sex and drugs by his own admission? Yeah. Yeah, I, I got people in Hollywood and industry. And they participate in the degeneracy of the culture of Hollywood and the industry. So yes, he did that. And we can condemn the behavior, but we, we should do it if we are to do it. We should do it in the context of condemning Hollywood culture. Don't condemn Bill Cosby. Condemn Hollywood and this culture. So, while he engaged in that, I see nothing to suggest that any of that was um, forcible. Any of that was other, was not at the women's distract discretion they wanted the drug sex and the sex and drugs culture of Hollywood. He and they participated in that. Yeah, we can take issue with that, but we can't lock them up as a rapist for that. <laughs> and but most importantly, we can't trash the constitution in order to lock him up as a rapist for that. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, 
you started the conversation off early on um, talking about the influence of Minister, uh, the Honorable Dr. Min- uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, um, his influence on hip hop even early on. And we see it still um, resonating throughout hip hop now, even though you see a lot of mainstream outlets um, attempting to silence Minister Louis Farrakhan's message throughout the Internet, throughout algorithms. We've seen even some high profile hip hop platforms say um, things that weren't true about Minister Farrakhan. We've seen hip hop rise again, saying that we can't um, tolerate that. We got to protect our leaders. What do you think um, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's influence on hip hop is now? And what do you feel about those um, people in hip hop rising up against naysayers, against um, Minister Louis Farrakhan? It's a remarkable phenomenon. There is nobody, nobody whose influence on hip hop is as transgenerational as this honorable minister Farrakhan from the 80s till mm-hmm. now. His today, there are more rappers name dropping Farrakhan today than it was in the 80s and 90s, which supposedly is the golden age of rap nationalism and Islam and hip hop. And they were name dropping the honorable Elijah Muhammad. But in 2019, 2020, 21, you got more rap who are not just name dropping Farrakhan, but seeking his guidance. Mm -hmm. The transgenerational impact of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on hip hop is such a remarkable phenomenon. Name me one other person who has the same power that Farrakhan has, and especially a so-called religious person, no one has the same power in terms of this influence on hip hop as the honorable brother Mr. Parker has. And going back to my initial point, I believe that there has been from the early 90s to now, the concerted effort to minimize the impact of the nation of Islam, minimize the influence of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan on Black America, minimize it by curtailing his influence in hip hop. And so hip hop has been weaponized to undo the impact that the message of Islam has on black people. I'm going to say this. The Honorable Mr. Lord Farrakhan said in, on November 16th, 2017, or maybe it's November 17th, 2016. He said this at Watergate Hotel in D.C. at a press conference. He said to the world, or said before the world, but talking to Muslims. He said, Muslims, don't you know that you are the last thing standing in the way of the enemy's plan to demasculinize Black America? The nation of Islam is the last line of defense against the total unmanning of Black America. And so to counter that influence, use hip hop to unman black America. Use hip hop to feminize black America. Use hip hop to homosexualize black America. And so, yes, I believe that, and if I can just, to prove that point, and then I, I will close this. Yes, sir. But I think I can prove the point that I'm making. A very important meeting 
occurred in the spring of 1996. The Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan and members of his staff had dinner at the Manhattan suite of Edgar Brofman Sr. Edgar, no, Seagram's Jen. Yeah. Edgar Brofman Singer. The Brofmans are described as the Illuminati of the New World. When you talk about the Illuminati and hip hop, we got to stop thinking about the Rothschilds. That's old establishment Illuminati. The new establishment, and you're not going to see too much of their influence in hip hop. So you think the critics say, ain't no one Illuminati influence in hip hop. You don't see evidence of the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds are old school. The new establishment Illuminati is led by the Brothman. And Edgar Brothman Sr., the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan in 1996, April. So let me back up. In January 1994, Edgar Brothman Jr., the son, met with Suge Knight in the Santa Monica restaurant and inked the deal to drop $200 million into Interscope on behalf of Death Row Records. Edgar Brothman Sink, that's January 1996. In April 1996, Edgar Brothman Sink had dinner with the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan. And he's trying to stunt on the Honorable Mr. Lord Farrakhan and listen to his words to the Honorable Mr. Lord Farrakhan. At the dinner table, he asked the minister, would you like some orange juice? The minister says, sure. Edgar Brothman Sr., head of the Illuminati of the New World, Edgar Brothman Sr. says, that's me. Because, of course, Tropicana and the orange juice they control that. He says, he says to the minister, he says, do you go to the movies? The minister said, yeah. He said, that's me. He said, do you listen to music? The minister said, yes. Edgar Brockman Sr. said, that's me. He's telling the minister, I control the music. You and your people listen. I control the movie. You and your people enjoy. I control the orange juice because Tropicana, you know, the hood love Tropicana. Mm -hmm. I control the beverages that your people enjoy. So those who control hip hop decidedly use hip hop to curtail the influence of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam on Black America. Powerful. We got Dr. Wesley Muhammad on the Hip Hop Uncensored yes. podcast. Got a lot more, but we'll save it for the next time. For time's sake, man, we uh we definitely appreciate you know you coming to the platform. You got anything else? We're gonna go, brother. Yeah. Um. Go ahead if you can. Uh. Any closing statements you want to make and drop your social media. You know where people can contact you as well, please. Yes, man. I, I I'm very honored to be invited to have this discussion on your your great platform. It's very important. Um, conversation. We need to keep having it, need to unpack it, need to expose it so we can get back control of hip hop. I, I described hip hop as a black, beautiful black style. But the writer of it right now is not us. The writer of this beautiful black style, hip hop, music, and culture are those who do not have the best interests of black people at heart. So we have to get back control. We have to corral this beautiful black stallion, get back on the saddle and get control of it. 
And so these conversations are necessary. The work you are doing is exceptional. I'm honored and grateful that you would invite your brother to your platform to have this discussion. My, I can be found um, on Facebook and Instagram, Wesley Muhammad, and YouTube, Wesley Muhammad. Also, you know, what we said, we documented in our book, Understanding the Assault, Volume 1 and 2, and this one specifically deals with the weaponization of hip-hop, the weaponization of marijuana, 800 pages and 1,000 footnotes. Mm. We don't conspiracy theorize. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy documentary. And so we produce, provided 2,000 footnotes confirming what we said. So we can be reached at, we have a website. Please just subscribe to it. Dr. Wesley dot online. That's Dr. Wesley dot online. Dr. Wesley Muhammad on the Hip Hop and Sense of Podcast. Yeah, yeah. It's been a true honor. And like you said, and like we said, we have to do this more and we definitely will. We'll have you back on real soon. Dr. Yeah. Muhammad on the Hip Hop and Sense of Podcast, brother. Thank you so much. Thank Salute. you, brother. All right. Hey. Take All care. Right. Take it easy. <clears throat>